Well, thank you so much um, to Dr. Miller and to everyone here for welcoming me back. It's great to be back. Uh, and this is pretty exciting for me because I get to talk about probably my favourite assignment that I've been in my three years uh, at the University of Winnipeg. Um, and so the purpose of today is to basically talk through my use of wiki education in the classroom, why I use this program, the challenges that I face, the outcomes. You'll also, as Dr. Miller suggested, get to hear from two of the students that were in the class, Marina and Paige, and they're going to share their individual perspectives on their learning. Uh, and just basically reflect on why I think this is a, a good program to use and why I think that it's um, particularly good for maybe replacing or being um, a different way of doing that traditional final research project. So that is what I'm going to be talking about today. So firstly, what is Wiki Education? Well, basically it is an arm of Wikipedia, which I'm sure you all know and use maybe more than you want to let on. Uh, so Wikipedia is the fifth most visited websites in the world, um, and it's essentially an online encyclopedia. And Wiki Education is an independent arm that is linked to Wikipedia with the aim of teaching students through collaboration with their instructors and through Wiki Education to become Wikipedia contributors and editors. So it's essentially a guided program that you can adapt and change um, to fit the needs of your particular class. And you can use it um, for you know, small scale projects, maybe just learning how to do citations or adding small elements to Wikipedia. Or you can do what I decided to do in my class, which was use Wiki Education to guide students through from no experience kind of at all in editing to actually creating full scale edits and, and actually full scale articles in the end. So that's kind of where Wiki Education sits. Um, so I'm definitely not the first person um, to do that. Um, but I think I, I was the first person to do this in the classics department either. Um, and um, yeah, so I would, I would basically really encourage people uh, to check it out and hopefully this talk is going to inspire you to do so. Why did I use this program at this particular time? So I feel like I have to really set the scene. Um, it was winter 2021. We had just, um, we were still in lockdown, I think it was some form of rather strict lockdown. Um, we had a very strict lockdown over that Christ 2020 Christmas. Um, we'd already had like eight to nine months of online learning. Everyone's exhausted, everyone's really pandemic out. I could simply not face grading another stack of paper on my computer. I was like, I need to do something else. So I was like, what can I do for my students that is going to have the most same impact? Um, it's going to be the same amount of rigorous learning and skill set for them for that kind of final research project, but it's not going to be that traditional final research paper. And so I had previously myself, for a couple of years prior to this, already been a Wikipedia editor. So I had experience um, on that personal side, and I've been part of a editing program called WCC Wiki. And I'll plug the New Directions YouTube channel because I gave, <laughs> gave my last New Directions talk on that. Uh, so if you want to learn more, you can check that out. But basically, I have had some previous experience as an editor, and I've also been in conversations with a colleague, Chelsea Gardner, at Acadia University, who had also used this program in the MIP class. And so, in conversations with her, I thought, no, I want to do this. Now, why I specifically chose the Roman Britain class out of all of my classes, also for a few reasons. And it was a small little class that I could teach in that term. Um, so I had, and I knew I would have around 20 or so students, maybe a few less. Um, so that was pretty small for my classes. It was also primarily upper level um, students. It was a 300, 400 level class at the University of Winnipeg. So there was um, many students in that class that I had taught previously. So I kind of felt from my perspective, there was that level of ease and comfort. I knew the students, I thought, yeah, I know that they can take this on. The class size kind of worked for me. And then as I said, you know, peak pandemic. And I was just like, we need something different. I was like, we're all exhausted. Uh, and we're all kind of bored of everything that we've been doing. Uh, so it's kind of perfect time and 
set of circumstances that I thought allowed me to do this. So that is why it happened at this particular time and for this particular Lyman Britain class. So, as I said, one of the kind of benefits I think of with the education is it's very flexible and adaptable to your particular course needs. Um, you can make it a small scale or large scale as you like. And the way, and I'll show you um, on later slides, the way the program is set up through this dashboard, you can kind of use the framework that with the education gives you and then make it fit into the timing and the model of your class. So at the University of Winnipeg, we have a 14 week semester with a one week reading break in the middle. Um, I picked a 12 week um, program that began in week three. So I wanted it to not last the full 14 weeks, but it was kind of the main aspect of the class. So it began in week three of the class. The first kind of part from weeks three to six, very much training focused. So this is where students really, outside of Roman Britain content, this is where they learn how to be with computer editors. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I think this program is so great, is that you're doing all of the traditional research that you would do to make a term paper, but you're also learning all of these digital humanities skills as well, and how to become an editor on one you know, very uh, prominent digital platform. So weeks three to six, very much training focus. Week six, so about <laughs> halfway through the project, was when students actually chose what they were going to do as their final project. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we went about choosing what they would do for their final projects a little bit later. So about halfway, they actually picked the page that they were going to add to. And then week seven was the reading break. Between kind of week eight and ten was really where the writing of the Wikipedia pages happened. There was drafting. We also had a peer review process. So this is also one of the things that I loved and I really wanted to incorporate into the class was that they drafted their version of their Wikipedia edit, and then another member of the class acted as a peer reviewer for it. So they also got experience in reviewing other people's work. And I think Paige and Marina may speak to this a little bit later about the benefit of actually having to step outside your own work and actually review and edit someone else's work. It then helps you, I think, in your own writing process. Week 12 was the final submission of the actual Wikipedia final page. That's when it got moved from our little dashboard into the real world of Wikipedia. And so it published in week 12, and then there's a final reflection on this entire project. I also chose to end with a reflective essay. So this was, I think, three to four pages, and I asked my students to reflect on what they had learned from the project, lessons that they thought that they could take on in, into other academic contexts, and just generally also, I wanted the feedback as well, like how successful have this been? <laughs> Are they all going to be like, it's just terrible, why are they doing this? Uh, luckily that was not the case, otherwise I wouldn't be speaking today. <laughs> um, so I ended with this reflective essay. So that was kind of the basic structure of how I went about. But as I said, this is just my structure. You could make an eight week program, a six week program, and you could really focus all the training into a very intense period of time and have longer for the drafting and review process. Um, as we see in a few later slides on the dashboard, you can really um, move all those pieces around into a way that you think will work for you. And you can also change it as the class went on. Uh, this is just what I set up. I think during the time I did move some of the deadlines around, um, and that worked. In terms of assessment, um, I think this was maybe from my uh, teacher perspective, something that I really, maybe it was harder for me because it's so outside of the realm of traditional grading. I was thinking, well, like, how am I actually going to assess this mode of learning? So obviously, as a class on Roman Britain, I wanted them to come away with um, some kind of traditional um, assessment. So throughout that term, we did also have four content-based quizzes um, that were worth 10% each. Um, so that was kind of a traditional mode of assessment. But the Wikipedia project was actually worth 60% of their entire grade. So it was a really significant part 
of that grade. And that 60% was divided up. 40% towards the various training, exercises, the editing, and the final publication, and then 20% on that final reflective essay. With the Wikipedia project part, I went with a very easy um, point space system. And really my thinking behind this at the time was, I just want to make it as easy as possible for everyone involved. Uh, this was the first time I was doing it, this was the first time the students were doing it, and I wanted it to be fairly easy to track. So I came up with this point system that essentially with every task involved on the dashboard, which we'll see in a minute, if you completed the task on time, each, each of these exercises had a series of points related to them. If you did it on time, you got 100% of the points. If you still completed the task, but maybe, you know, one week, super crazy, it was the you know, peak pandemic time, but you still got it done, you just got half the points. So I really encourage my students, I was like, ultimately, if you fall a little bit behind, you still want to do everything because there's still a benefit and you still get half the points. The only time um, you're going to get zero points is if you just don't do that particular exercise. So that was the really basic points-based system that I came up with for Wikipedia. I think I would maybe tweak elements of this. I'm going to talk about um, some of the difficulties with that a bit later on. But I think overall, I was happy that I set it up that way for the first time I did this because it just kind of took the pressure off that I thought this is really clear and obvious and, and each of the students could just track their progress that way. So this is what the actual dashboard looks like for Wikipedia. So you basically have and set up as an instructor your own um, individual dashboard. And each of your students at the beginning of the term, they sign up to Wikipedia with an account and they have a special code that gives them access to the dashboard. And then within that dashboard, it's like your own little mini insular Wikipedia world. No one else can see what you're doing except you and your instructor. And so my dashboard allowed me to see all the students and what they were doing, tracking their process, progress, whether they had um, fulfilled all of the requirements for that particular week. But essentially, the student view would look very similar to this, but obviously the tracking was just reflective of their own uh, progress. So it kind of mirrored, it looked exactly the same, but I just had access to what everyone was doing. And so you can see it's kind of organized, there's this home screen, which is basic information. And then at the top, I had a timeline, and I'll show you this in a bit, where all the tasks are broken down. And then I also had, you know, various elements about in my students tab, that is where I could then click on each individual student and actually see exactly where each of them were in the process. And this is how it looks when you went on to the timeline view. So essentially, organised by week, and when I was setting up this class, I would, I plugged in all of these dates, the weeks, and I said, flexible to your particular Term structure. So I just plugged in all of the dates relevant for the University of Winnipeg and then added in the various parts. And it's essentially a kind of like plug, you kind of take a template and you basically just like drop it into the weeks that you want to use um, a particular training or um, an exercise. And so you can kind of see here that the way it works is there are various training modules um, to train you in elements. Here it talks about sandboxes, talk pages, or watch lists, which will mean absolutely probably nothing uh, to any of you, but um, by the end of the class, you know what those were. Um, and then various exercises to practice the editing skills that you were being taught about, and then obviously editing guides as you went through. So each week, there will be a box like this, um, I think on the next page, yeah. And it would give you particular tasks and it had a new date. And essentially, you had to go through, you know, the training or the exercise in full, and then it would automatically track, yes, the student has completed it. So the student would know, I've done what I need to do this week. I would then automatically also see this is how they're on track. And it was really easy. I could just go onto my instructor dashboard, and if anyone was Kind of late or it was maybe the last day it was due it was then really easy for me to send them a little nudge and just say 
were you aware that there was a train due, you know, this week? And week six is an example of one of the types of exercises that kind of crop over between um, students working on this in kind of their own time, I suppose, and actual live Zoom classes. So part of the process was that we would sometimes have discussions about particular aspects of Wikipedia or what they had learned about the training process. And then we would actually kind of have those discussions in live live Zoom classes. Obviously, if you were doing this in person, you could just post that discussion point as homework and then you could actually have the discussion in class. So that's kind of how I brought it into the um, Zoom room at the same time. And here's just some other examples of what the different weeks look like. You can see, um, oh, that's the wrong way around, but week eight, start drafting your contributions. And you can see the training here was about plagiarism. So a kind of very broad academic concept, and then drafting in the sandbox, which is a very specific Wikipedia concept. So I really tried with the balance of the exercises that I worked into my dashboard to get that balance of they need to obviously learn the specific skill to, skill to create the end product, but I also want them to be able to situate it, situate that within a broader kind of academic writing. Context. So things like plagiarism, um, importance of citations, learning about peer review, those kind of things, you know, are obviously applicable to lots of different types of academic writing. And this is what one of the trainings actually looks like. Um, adding citations, and you can see here in this tutorial, you'll learn how to add citations to an article using the visual editor and wiki code. So there are two forms of editing in Wikipedia. You can do it in a very traditional kind of coding way, but one of the benefits on Wikipedia is you can do the whole thing without even looking at a bit of code, which I think as a digital humanities platform is, is quite appealing to students, but I think Sometimes with digital humanities project, projects, the coding can be a bit intimidating. I know it means this for me. So the fact that in this visual editor, it just kind of looks like a Word document and you're working away. There's obviously this code going on in the background, but you're not aware of it. You can also see here that it says estimated time to complete. So this training exercise, 10 minutes. Uh, that kind of reflects a lot of the exercises anywhere between kind of 10 and 30 minutes. So they're, they're designed as pretty bite-sized chunks. Now it's a little bit, um, it's obviously not highlighted on the table of contents very well because I haven't gone through it, but just to mm. kind of tell you what the table of contents said, it says citations, why verify, examples of reliable sources, gather your sources, add a, refre uh, add a reference section, add a citation, practice use citations, and citation with the code. So again, you can see in that training that it's a balance of we're teaching you how to do this on Wikipedia, but we are situating it within you know why we use citations in the first place and what kind of purpose they have in academic writing. So to the kind of pedagogical challenges that I face, um, and I was kind of reflecting on this because it's sometimes hard. With a bit of distance and it, it was so successful you know and it was received so well at the end that i was like yeah everything was great. Uh, actually i was like oh no there were plenty of challenges obviously with anything that's new you don't really know what you're going to do. Uh, and i think the biggest challenge for me was just that newness of and this happens when you set any new assignment you know you don't know how the students are going to respond to it you're not sure if the assessment structure is going to work and um, so you know that's that's something that you may be encountering with any new um, assessments now the online format obviously had some benefits but also i think some challenges again one of the reasons why i picked this assignment for the time was i was like we're all online anyway why not do this specific project but I think that there would have been, it would have been easier to do some elements of it in person. Um, I would have really liked it if we could all have had like mini editing thons and all together where we could be working on it. That would be easier for me to also troubleshoot any problems in real time. Whereas 
you know, I have to go through that, okay, we'll get on Zoom, we'll maybe screen share. It's a bit awkward sometimes to sort out these little issues. Whereas if it was in a class scenario, I imagine those small things would have been um, solved fairly easily. Um, so I think having the ability to have the in-class contact time would have actually made it better. Student access to resources. Again, there were elements to this that were specifically pandemic related. So the University of Winnipeg Library at the time was closed in person to students. Um, we were very, we were very lucky. They had some excellent online resources, but there were challenges in getting some access to things that hadn't been digitized at that point. Um, also, in general, I think when you're setting up this class, you want to make sure that the project that you are setting up that the university library is going to have the resources to allow the students to actually do the research for the pages. Um, sometimes you're not really going to know that until um, you get into it. Um, as you'll see, one of my students chose to do an article on dogs in Roman Britain. I was like, I do not know where to start. <laughs> Luckily, we have Michael Pinnock in the department. <laughs> I was like, do you on top, right? and then you all of this stuff, and then I can the students. So, you know, I have to kind of tap into some networks there. Um, the same, I think one of the students was doing stuff on the bar curse tablets, and I think Dr. Rippat gave me a bunch of resources um, because I needed that aligned with some of her research interests. So, not ideal access to resources all the time, but we managed to make it work. Managing the peer review process from an instructor perspective was a little bit stressful because obviously it relies on all your students being on time at that moment. And also you're trying to match people up that are maybe doing similar enough articles that they're going to have something um, constructive to say. Um, and also that they're going to be able to review the other person's article in a good way um, as well. So, um, and there were, there were a couple of elements in that week eight to ten period, where some people were behind in a couple of trainings, they did do them, but again, that kind of shifted the balance of trying to manage who was reviewing who. So that was probably the hardest part in terms of organisation. Obviously, as I said, I one of my main motivators for this was I could not face writing another set of essays on my small 11 inch screen laptop. Um, so I was like, this will be easier. Um, it's still very labor intensive it's in a different way. Um, it's like a lot of tracking of the various activities. Now the dashboard does make that very straightforward, but it does still require that kind of oversight and management. And this links to this um, my earlier point about the online format, I was unable to have those in-person troubleshooting. So I think maybe some of the added labour, again, just reflective of that particular pandemic -y, um, mm -hmm. online world. Moving forward, and I think where I maybe didn't get the balance right, was the effective grading of the very final page product. Um, so if we go... Yes, so... The point space system worked really, really well for all the training, all of the peer review process, everything. I have also put this point space system for actually the final page that they publish. Um, the only thing that I graded kind of traditionally on like a A, a to F, you know, scenario um, was that reflective essay. Now, the, the benefit well, the challenge with that then is, you know, there's variation in the quality, the amount of words put in, you know, how extensive the edits were. I don't think moving to um, like a traditional grading scale would work either because, well, maybe with a really complicated rubric, but again, sometimes the end point of the edits, I knew that a student had put in a lot of work, but like the end result maybe would just be like one added citation. Mm -hmm. But I knew that like the amount of time it took to track it down, finding the resource, all of these things. So like the outcome, it was very hard to uh, compare and contrast. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure I have a solution to that, but it's something that I would think about again in the future, because I don't think either the traditional model um, or that point space system is a perfect solution, uh, and that's something that I want to think about in, in the future. 
So those are the challenges. Uh, these are the benefits. Uh, sorry. So the stats from the class. Um, in the end, we ended up having uh, 17 pages that were um, edited, kind of pretty much from scratch into the, into the format. 945 individual edits from those across those 17 pages. Uh, 13,600 words added. 20 new images on Wikimedia Commons, which is like the photo arm of Wikipedia, and 286 new references. Like, that's probably my favorite stat. <laughs> so I think the references is a, is a really good thing to add to Wikipedia. And within one month of the articles being published, those 17 pages have had over 400,000 page views. And, you know, for me, that's one of like the obvious wins of this whole project in that, you know, most students, you write a paper, one person reads it. Maybe your parents, if they're really keen, would read it, but I mean, it's good though, um, you know, or your partner or something like that. But in general, you're writing a paper once. Um, this is like, wow, loads of people are reading my work. And I'm just like 400,000 of like 17 students. That's like a lot of views. Um, and obviously, the people that are reading this, unless they are editors themselves and go into like the back page of the Wikipedia and look at who's doing the edit, they don't know that it's from from Winnipeg, but like you know, like, you know that you're reaching that many people. Um, so that they're the overall um, stats that we had. To break it down in terms of what students actually, uh, the pages that students actually contributed to. This is a summary of the pages that we um, contributed to. And it's um, at this point that I'll talk a little bit about how the um, students came to those decisions. So there are two ways that you can set up um, a Wiki Education project. It can be pretty free reign in that a student could just pick any page. Or you can, as an instructor, you can create a kind of pre approved list of articles that you think. These are going to be good articles that students can contribute to. I went for that option because I, I wanted to make sure that students were kind of uh, focused in, in a certain um, type of way. How I narrowed it down um, was with Wikipedia, they basically have a page rating system. And the kind of three um, lowest ratings, I suppose, are X, which basically is like the article has started, but there's not really anything there. And then there's B and C, which are kind of like intermediate articles they still need developing. Um, and then there are like A articles and GA, which is like good article. They're like the friend of the articles. So I picked all pages that were either that S, B, or C category. So either, you know, pretty much nothing or just the bare bones because I really wanted students to be able to contribute significant amounts to these pages. Um, so the, these were the pages kind of with those ideas, we narrowed it down and then there are a couple of other pages that Marina and Paige also contribute to do that they are going to talk about some more in very soon. Um, in terms of what the students added, uh, it really did depend on the page. Um, some people, it was very content heavy, like just basic kind of adding words. Um, some people, there were a lot of photographs that went into it. Um, this is one of the photos from Chegler. Um, we were very, very lucky that in the class, we did have a few students that actually visited some of the sites. They had a personal interest. And they also have their own personal photographs, which works really well in terms of copyright. So I'm like, yes, mm -hmm. do that page, and yes, you know, add, add in. Uh, so this is this is one um, from Ron's page on on Chedworth Villa. This is an image that he took. It's still on the page now. So even you know, two years later, no, no one's found a better image. So uh, so yeah, 20, 20 images were added. This is one of them. Uh, and as I said, lots of citations, sometimes building a page from pretty much scratch. I think um, the Roman Client Kingdoms one, it was essentially just a list of the client kingdoms when um, Amelia edited that page. And by the end, it actually had a bunch of relevant context, you know, not just a list of the client kingdoms. Um, similarly, like Tacitus Agricola, at the time, it just basically had a very brief summary of the text. 
uh, that was really pumped out and we an expert content. So yeah, depending on the page, um, depending on the edits. One thing that was also really cool was the Britannia inferior and Britannia superior pages. Those are two separate pages. That was one instance where it was very natural to pair up them through the peer review process. And it was great. Um, both two student editors really worked together to also add in lots of links to each other's pages. So it was like collaborating on several levels because they were, they were improving both of their pages simply by linking them all together. Um, so that was, that was really great to watch. That's enough for me now. Uh, so that was kind of our overall um, editing drive. Um, and now I'm going to hear from Marina first and then pay about their specific experiences. And then I'm just going to come back at the end and reflect on it. So I'm going to have some awkward white chains for the No, that's fine. <laughs> okay, uh, here's a word in the week. I'm going to be on the next slide. First of all, first of all, I'm going to be And the page of how she was to be able to be on the was two weeks. Um, I'm talking to me and later on the British Navy version of the Colonel Sermon Training. So we can write the picture of my um garden. And um yeah, the format is like a little off, but yeah, so <laughs> um so here is what I did. I focused primarily on the things. So I added all of it and removed the existing content on the page. Um I created new headers uh from scratch, and then I also added some images as well. So um, as far as what I added to scratch, I did Swiss in the Arts and Geography. So um, just because I thought it was a good opportunity to combine images or um, texts um, involving Swiss. And then I also added two of the modern literature to give them things in the today to go out. Um, as far as challenges that I found, um, this was a really wonderful exercise in writing um, because from what I kind of got out of the day to your lessons was that they want four things as far as content. So they want properly cited statements from a credible source explained in an original way that the general public can understand, which is kind of a, uh, a large task mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the way that I survived on it by the Swing Google Museum, which is the tags in the walls, describing objects, um, just in a neutral way that's not comprehensible, strictly factual. Um, and that's very different from how I used to write it, typically graphic, which is um, on the basis of the um, so that was definitely uh, a good exercise in writing for me. And it was really interesting how to make the work be a positive work in progress that everybody had access to. So we went get too attached to certain pieces or ideas that you would like to on the page because it, it is likely and very possible that someone will disagree with you, feel mm -hmm. not necessary, or you have to change something a little bit. Whereas in a paper, of course, you write it, you edit it, and it's hard to use. Um, and so this was really beneficial in my own writing. It also was a really good process. And um, the content that was already there written by people previously, I did that as well. So, um, so I included at the top there a comment from Michael Lerner, I believe. He would be in the back of the Atlas, and I was being a student, so there's a little bit of overlap there. Um, and she had noticed on the page along the lines of, Oh, that sounds like a nice page. And I looked back and, and realized, Oh my goodness, we definitely have some broken room with the whole feeling since so we used to writing in there. Um, and then there was another paragraph that's just on the page already that um, I thought was a little generalized and opinionated. Um, so I went on to the top page of the Wikipedia, which um, is not every Wikipedia page at the top. We have the content and we have the top page. Um, and I suggested taking it down, and someone agreed with me and that the statements were a little bit concise. So then I took it down, 
was a cool little like you brush with a stranger. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was definitely a big part of it for me was the writing. And then another aspect of it, which I had a real hard time, <laughs> was um, having images and if you were in an elegant program, the four images that I have on the screen, um, those are all images that I added. The three vertically to the left are images that I found. The image of that um, in particular, that's the old image. So um, it was quite a process because unless images were on, depending on what you're intending on doing with it, so you have to have away unless it's else it'll get real scary. <laughs> so if it's your own image, that's great. You have a problem with that image. If it's not, um, there is sort of a process that you can follow. So, um, how you start is you go on Creative Commons and search for the image, and it's now actually called Open Your Space. Uh, you find the image, then you have to upload it to Open Your Commons under the correct license, and then you can upload it to Open Your Commons. So, um, I ended up uploading two photos under, uh, I guess, the incorrect license, and um. And we have a little more message and it's such a very kind of female podcast. <laughs> and I think the response is something along the lines of like, hey Marina, everything will be okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's lovely about you know, I'm uh <laughs> but yeah, um, you can see just the open verse uh search options there are the licenses on the side, so um the comments and then various uses that go with the image. Uh, finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, my experience with the project. And um, really, one of the main things that I took away from it was just an entire new understanding of Wikipedia. Um, I'm sure some people can really relate to the fact that we've been warned against Wikipedia um, for many years, especially through. And people in high school, and it's not reliable and you can edit it, so therefore you don't get to use. Um, and you can now feel very friendly in the fact that they do have a good, um, like, clean sort of uh, system where they go through articles and make sure that there are certain things in there. But it's also just a wonderful way to get a general overview of the topic, um, whether academic or not. I uh, use it for that amount of time. And then if you are doing an academic project, it is a great place to start as far as getting an overview for yourself. And um, going off of the sources at the bottom for further research to find directions to go with that. So very useful in that way. And then the other thing that I really think would be of course was just the um, issues around sources and violence, especially now and in the future. But our so uh, online world is so evolving all the time, and then we get to share information with one another. Um, so I really took that into the college years, and even still now when I'm doing my own work and research, looking at sources and maps, examining the map. So I have three questions here, which I absolutely don't have answers to. That's the best thing. <laughs> Um, so from that, what I'm still wondering about is, um, is putting this access based on the content. So like I said before, Wikipedia is looking for very specific kind of content, like peer reviews, um, published, uh, preference for scholarly articles. Um, but if I didn't have access to JSTOR and SOHOST and library through the university, I'm not sure how I would want to find those sources. So wonderful for students um, and a really good project for universities. So if I wasn't in uh, in a course doing it, I'm not sure how I would go about finding those sources um, outside of the European convention to be stuck with resources like that. Um, and yeah, as a follow-up, this is when it is eligible to edit articles when Wikipedia has their Story says that anyone can do it, which of course is true, but the, the information that we're looking for is also important. Okay. Um, so, yeah, our other less ideal sources so um, news articles, blog posts, blogs, stories, 
which is so amazing and helpful for when people started doing events or lessons that are not as valuable when it comes to this collective you know, these labs for their unique tool, it's a loss, you know, there's many elements and things. And then we talk a little bit this oh, this and the lessons as well, that uh, as a result of that, our content gaps created within the topics. So both in terms of who's accessing the information, but also the information itself, um, who created it, who wrote it, etc. Um, so when it comes to historically marginalized groups or underrepresentation, issues of access, it's really a whole poem of words <laughs> that you can talk about for hours. And I'm really passionate about that. So I'm really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. um, alongside the, the kind of technical and real life skills and exercises in writing, um, yeah, and two years later, I'm still really, I feel like I'm benefiting from these projects. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, hello everyone, I'm Katie. Um, I'd like to thank my professor for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm in my first year of my master's in classics at the University of Manitoba, and I just recently graduated. I think it's more than five years, so it, I was here for a while from this Um My slides are not as nice as those. But it wouldn't be the case if I chose just to do that. Um, I actually don't remember that it's not from this, but I just decided, yeah, <laughs> good for me. Um, she was a warrior queen uh, of the British Mississippi tribe who led an uprising against strong forces in approximately 60, 61 CE. Um, upon reviewing the initial article, I had uh, decided to focus my attention on the section regarding her name and her history, mostly, sorry, the name. Um, both sections were lacking in general citations across the board. Uh, and I put a lot of citations in that I was actually caught for on the top page. They said I put too many citations. But you need this, so And neither section really prevented you with that as a person. Uh, is just contextual information. So I wanted to really insert her as a human being in this work as much as we possibly can in the future. Um, I added primary source citations regarding the etymological histories um, of her name, Beyond Practice. Um, really, the only information was the information of the additional C that he added um, incorrectly. <laughs> and then it was copied by scribes for many years, um, which also led to several variations of her name. Um, the C eventually morphed into an E, and the U eventually became A, and none of that was in there. I also added uh, the Victoria um, progression of her name. That wasn't in there. They didn't think that all um, in the history section, uh, there were several subsections that I focused on with her to the horror cases. Um, I packed it with primary source material from Captain Theo and Captain. Um, of her background, I completely reorganized the section. It was atrocious. Um, and added a ton of citations as well. Adding material on the subject, uh, came craft, craft, Trust I can never say that her uh, of the editing and details of her apocryphal speech in Catholic, which comes back later. Things like that. Um, in the initial actions, uh, I also added uh, contextual Roman history about um, the events that lead up, led up to her revolt, her meeting the revolt, which was also removed because there is now a whole 
uh, section of we really come to where we don't um, pick on from here. So thank you for providing a picture. That's all you. <laughs> Biggest challenges, uh, my personal tone. I have a lot of inflection in my writing, if you really want to know. Um, and that was something immediately when I got my peer reviews back. Oh my gosh, yeah, it does sound very human when I'm speaking. So I think I figured it out in the end, moved myself on it. And then the talk page in itself is quite intimidating. Not for my edits, but um, my article has actually been upgraded to the May status now. It has received probably the biggest overhaul post this class of any of the articles. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a funny little shouldn't move the picture, but I did. Mm -hmm. um, there's a section on Londinium. And someone commented that not everyone knows about Londinium and it should be removed. And only people who get their information from comic books would know about Lindinium. With a sarcastic smiley face at a negative, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if I had in my edit, I would be like, so kind of <laughs> it, it eventually is still there, I believe, because Lindinium is one thing. <laughs> but, you know, that's what you go to the talk with, you see the little girl on the <laughs> Um, final thoughts. Wikipedia is always a work in progress. As I said, my article has been completely revamped. Um, but you can still see in our dashboard, I believe, where my edits are still being used and um, several sections were expanded upon. And you can still see my little blue or blue purple, actually, yeah. purple color of the small amount of letters that they kept for mine. I don't know where. In the two years since the project, it's become an uh, article and it's been viewed itself over 100,000 times or almost 100,000 times. Um, most of the primary source material is still there, which I'm very happy about. Um, they edited my repeated citation because I'm kind of convinced those a little bit, but all the sources I added are still there, which I was very happy about. Um, because I'm familiar with the back end of Wikipedia, I actually investigated the user pages of a few of the editors who edited my work. And the user piece ray in particular is probably one of the biggest people in the Wikipedia community. <laughs> um, he is an avid member of the Wikipedia community, who has been granted the status of master editor free, uh, which requires a minimum of 60,000 edits and eight years of service on the site, which is very impressive. Um, and he also hosts, um, presents at, and mm -hmm. travels the country to put on Wikipedia events for mm -hmm. People like us who care about the Wikipedia community so much that they go to picnics and talk about their edits for And actually, as of January 19th, I will tell this time, possibly I saw it yesterday, um, he became the 1400 most active English Wikipedia of all time. Very exciting. Um, in conclusion, this work is beneficial to not only us, but obviously everyone else who looks at the articles. Um, because we're getting a better picture of what these articles should look like in an academic sense. Um, and learning the editorial process of Wikipedia has helped me tenfold with my own writing, which is important. Trying not to be writing as if so much. Um, mm -hmm. And it elevates everything beyond just fun. If you spend any time with people, you will guarantee you come out a better writer. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your um, page. Um, so just very briefly to, to end, I just wanted to kind of reflect on the overall process 
and um, what I have learned and some of the like really great things that came out of this uh, project. Um, so Marina and Paige actually covered many of these um, elements already, so I won't go into a super amount of detail. Um, but as I said, that end um, reflective essay was an opportunity for all of the students to reflect on their experience. And as an instructor, I think reading these was like my favorite part because I got to really see how the project had um, impacted them. And um, there were kind of these key themes that emerged across all of the reflective essays. Um, they just liked that it was different and refreshing, something new to do. Um, sense of personal achievement and fulfillment in that public facing nature. Um, again, similar to normally you write a paper, one person reads it, that's it. This is like you're doing it, it's out there, people are reading it, people are still reading it. Uh, and I think it's like you students should have a sense of pride in that. Uh, because you're you're actually contributing to this body of global knowledge. As Marina and Paige so wonderfully articulated, lots of reflection as well on the value of knowledge dissemination and the limits and benefits of open access resources in terms of who has access to it and you know to to what extent. Benefits of collaboration. Everyone said that um, you know they didn't just enjoy that community process, but also being part of or feeling like they were part of this broader Wikipedia community, like I am now a Wikipedia editor. Um, and then, as as William Page also said, those new research and writing skills. Um, and this quote here, um, I just thought was really great. Um, one to said this project has had a profound impact on the way in which I perceive how information is composed and distributed. As I've come to realize the privilege of having access, I should say, to vast amounts of resources that are usually limited for the general public. So this really speaks to Marina's point about like kind of who has access, therefore that limits who is writing it content gaps and it kind of ends up becoming a bit of a can of worms. So it really kind of crystallizes so many of those um, issues and questions. We also got some really cool press. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, we lost to Dr. Miller for that um, excellent pun. Um, so because I have written a thread on Twitter about these are all the cool things that my students have published, um, with, with the education themselves came to me and said, would you like to write on our blog about it? And that's, I, I wrote kind of extensively about these themes that emerged. From that, we had a University of Winnipeg article. And then my biggest claim to fame is that we ended up on the front page of the Winnipeg Free Press City and Business section. <laughs> Not entirely sure why that's section, but anyway, we'll talk about it. Um, and yes, so it's really, really cool that it also sparked like broader public interest. Um, and the article was really great. Also, because it was a pandemic, it was really weird. Um, the, the photographer had to come to my house and like take a picture of me from a distance. But like, the laptop and then they spoke and it was all very, very odd. Very um, but yes, it was very, very cool to also have that wider recognition. And so, yeah, this was another, I thought I would just end also on this great quote, again, from a student's um, final reflective essay. I had a realisation that knowledge is not only meant to dwell in an academic setting, but should exist everywhere. Um, so I just think that kind of really summed up some of the main benefits of this kind of project. So... Thank you, everyone. Uh, and now I think we will open to questions um, for myself.